Hi guys, we're out here at the Legends and we're asking about the key virtue of peace. Oh. I don't know what a virtue is. You don't know what a virtue is? Does anybody here know what a virtue is? She's a virtue. Why? Because she's beautiful. She's sweet. She's my granddaughter. <laughs> See, so she just described some virtues to you. Wasn't that nice of her? Get off your phone! All right, close your eyes. Imagine you're in a peaceful place. Okay, keep them closed. Can I ask you what the first thing you think of when you hear the word peace? Calm. Calm? Imagine the peaceful place. Wow, dang it, you were supposed to keep your eyes closed. <laughs> I just really want to see how long you keep your eyes closed. Good job, thanks, dude. <laughs> That's so funny. Hello, Westside Family Church. How are you doing today? Uh, greetings to you here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary Speedway. Those of you who are watching online, a particular shout out today from Connor, who is watching from uh, Iowa Western Community College. Let's give it up for Connor and all those who have joined us online. We're so delighted to have you. Um, there was a woman who went to a psychiatrist complaining uh, about uh, some anxiety she was experiencing from a, from a terrible phobia. She said, every time I lay down on my bed, um, I experience this enormous fear that there's something underneath. The psychiatrist said, wow, I've never heard of such a phobia before, but like all phobias, it can be treated, but it's likely going to take about 20 sessions. And so the lady asked, well, how much will that cost for each session? And he said, well, it'll be about $80 uh, for each session, but I promise you it'll be well worth it. When the psychiatrist did not hear back from the lady, he decided to finally pick up the phone and call her and ask her, why didn't I hear from you? And she says, well, when I went home to tell my husband about the cost, he decided to save some money. He just simply cut the legs off of the bed. <laughs> I love that. We all experience anxiety and worry and fear and phobias. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the solution were as simple as cutting the legs off of our bed? But unfortunately, for most of us, it's not that easy. I did some research on and stats on anxiety and discovered that there are two types of worriers. There is the general worrier, and then there's a group of people known as GAD, a generalized anxiety disorders, uh, in which you can identify which one are you. A general worrier might worry up to 55 minutes a day, where a person with a anxiety disorder will actually worry up to 300 minutes a day, or five hours a day. Anxiety disorders are the most common illness in the United States with an estimated 40 million people experiencing it every year, uh, ages 18 and older. That is 18.1% of the entire U.S. populations. It's interesting. Anxiety disorders are actually highly treatable, but only 36.9% of people who experience anxiety actually seek treatment. There are six types of anxiety. We can talk about those in the days to come, but it's interest, interesting stat. Uh, U.S. Uh, residents are the highest experiencers of anxiety anywhere in the entire world. And that's really something interesting to ponder, isn't it? Given our wealth and our position as the greatest nation on earth, obviously the solution to peace is not simply making more money, right? And it's also uh, true that more women suffer from anxiety than men. Some suggest it may be because of the men, uh, but that's another story altogether. Anxiety disorders affect 25.1% of all children in the United States between the ages of 13 to 18. That means one in four of our teenagers are suffering from anxiety. Pay careful attention. Look a little deeper, ask a few more questions. Anxiety uh, is very debilitating and can actually uh, 
catalyze physical illness in your life that's pretty devastating. We are reminded that our physical and spiritual and mental and emotional life is all connected together. When one is affected, it often spills over and affects the others. That's how God has wired us. Listen to this. 85% of subjects who have worried have never actually, 85% of what uh, people worry about, 85% actually never happens. Did you hear that? 85% of the subject that people worry about actually never happens. And of the 15% that does happen, 79% said that they were able to handle the difficulty better than expected. And the rest of them said that it was actually an experience that they were grateful for at the end because it helped them uh, to grow and learn. I love what Mark Twain says. He says, I am an old man and I have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. This leads us to uh, the key uh, opening line of our key verse today found on uh, the opening page of your Believe book. And it reminds us that God does not want us to live this way. The passage comes from Philippians chapter four, verse six. Uh, shout out just the opening line with me. Ready? Do not be anxious about anything. 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 I'm good with that. Are you? <laughs> I'm fine with the idea, but someone's going to have to help me. How in the world do we get there? Which leads to our key question today that we're going to spend a few moments at least touching on how to ask and answer this question. Here it is. Where do I find strength to battle anxiety and fear? Anybody interested? I know I am. What does the Bible say is what matters to us? Um, and so what I want you to look at is uh, first is 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, we find a lesser known story of a lady named a Shunammite woman. Her son has died and she takes off on a donkey and makes a beeline to the prophet Elisha. And when Elisha sees her coming in a distance, he sends one of his associates uh, to ask her a question. And here's the question she asked him. Are you all right? Are you all right? The word all right in the Hebrew is the word shalom. And the word shalom means peace. When he asked her if she was all right, he was essentially asking her, are you at peace. Biblically, the very core of being at peace, the opposite of anxiety and worry, is whether things are right. We oftentimes confuse the feeling of peace with genuine peace. The outcome of peace is the anxiety going away. But if we don't distinguish what peace is from the feeling of peace, we can get ourselves into trouble because there are ways to actually take substances that will give you the feeling of peace without ever dealing with the core cause of the anxiety to begin with. And when you're not careful and you assume that biblical peace is the feeling of peace, you can get yourself into deep trouble. The feeling of peace is the desired outcome when you have genuinely biblically based peace. Biblically based peace are when things are right. And particularly when we study the scriptures from beginning to end, it's when things are right in our relationships with others. That's the core idea. And particularly as it relates to three relationships, it, which forms our key idea today. I'm gonna to ask you to say it out loud with me, ready? I am free from anxiety because I have found peace with God, peace with others, and peace with myself. So with the time I have, I wanna just kinda of give you at least a taste of what each of these three relationships means in living at peace. First of all, things are right with God. On page 371 of your Believe book, or in Romans chapter five, we are told that we were born 
as enemies of God. That doesn't seem fair, but the way in which this happened is that we are born as a part of, connected to the human race, and so therefore the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden automatically is transferred to us. The sin virus automatically transfers to us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 says uh, that not only is this a, a kind of a sad thing that you were born into the human race and automatically receive this sort of enmity with God, but Colossians 1 21 tells us that you actually acted out in your own evil behavior. The way in which we uh, treat each other, the way in which we relate to God in our natural state puts us at odds with God. I think that we know this instinctively. Most people I meet sense that there is something not right between us and God. Now, some people would say, I don't feel any lack of peace. I don't feel any lack of peace with God. But the truth is, they, there is not peace with God. And just because you don't feel a lack of peace with God doesn't mean that you are not enemies with God. And if you don't deal with the truth that, in fact, you are an enemy of God, the outcome will not be a feeling of peace, but the outcome will be utterly devastating, the Bible says. You have to deal with this, uh, which leads us uh, to uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Um, the question becomes, how do we make our relationship with God right? Now, recently I've been watching on like Netflix or something, this sitcom called The Good Place. It is hilarious. It is really funny. Uh, it is all about how a person gets into the good place or heaven. And the whole show is about collecting points to have enough goodness in your life to get there. It's hilarious, but it is completely fallacious, right? The Bible teaches something completely different. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 gives us the answer. Take a look at this. Page 371 of your belief book. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. I want you to underline the word justified. That's a thick theological word you're gonna see throughout the scriptures, particularly in the writings of Paul. We are justified. That's a fancy way of saying made right. Justified means made right. The Bible teaches that when we admit that we are at odds with God, because of our sin, that's called repentance. And that we ask for the work of Christ on the cross to be applied to our account. The Bible says that we are made right with God. That our accounts are clean. We are debt free. We are all right. We are shalom. We are at peace. So number one, if you want true peace, get right with God. Get right with God. And that's only available through faith in Jesus Christ. And we know, because you told us, about one in 14 of all Westsiders have not yet made this decision. You're seeking, and that's exciting, but I'm hoping that maybe today is the day that you set that down and become at peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you are among the forgiven, hearing my words, you probably have figured out that even though you have come to faith in Christ, that you still sin. Can I get an amen? amen. Hear, um, hear me out. Because you sin, you do not lose your position with God. You are a child of God, and this is a one-way covenant relationship. We talked about a couple of weeks ago, God has made a one-way covenant relationship through Christ so that not even you can snatch yourself out of his hand. Can I get another amen? However, when we disobey the will and the word of God, uh, it puts ourselves on the path of the prodigal. And we discover in the story of the prodigal son that in fact, God never turned his back on the prodigal. It was the prodigal who turned his back on the father. And whenever you turn your back on God, you create distance between you and God. I remember when I was a kid and whenever I did anything wrong, um, I did not pursue my parents. I avoided them. 
And the same it is when our, with our relationship with God. But God offers this promise to believers over and over again. John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, believers, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you want true peace, followers of Jesus, point number two, stay right with God. Stay right with God. Some of you need to do that today. You need to turn around and run towards God and you'll experience peace. I love what in some old time uh, Pentecostal and Baptist churches say whenever they, they make a comment like this, they said, do I have a witness? So I asked, do I have a witness that whenever you turn around and run toward God, the sense of peace goes up? Do I have a witness? Amen. Amen. Okay, now things uh, right with others. That's the second relational category. The majority of tension that exists within the pit of our stomach comes when there is tension, our things are not right in our relationships with others. Some of you right now have relationships that are, that are really sideways, and, and even as I bring it up, it just creates that sort of tension in the pit of your stomach. I wanna give you a, just a taste of the advice, practical advice that the Bible offers on how to bring resolution to these so that peace can increase. Let's start off with the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, or page 376 of your belief book. Jesus says, If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Here's a practical principle. Write this down. Getting your relationship right Getting your relationship right is a higher priority than worship. Can you believe this? I, I don't know uh, how Jesus could state the importance of this any stronger. The Bible offers like zero excuses for missing worship with fellow believers. Like there's no snow clause there. There's no I have soccer with my kids today clause. But this is the one clause that is offered for you to miss worship. If on a particular Sunday you're driving uh, to Westside and in that process you remember or recognize that there is a, a distance between you and another person likely caused even by you and it's just dawning on you, you're to pass right over Westside and go to their home and get that reconciled, and then come back for the five o'clock service later that day. <laughs> you take the relationship between Abraham and his nephew Lot. Some of you are familiar with it, some of you are not, but, but God is blessing them. I mean, they are growing numerically as a family, they're growing in their wealth, and they're running out of space. They're on top of each other, and conflict is emerging. And so Abraham takes action. Page 374 of your Believe book, or Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. This is what Abraham does. So Abraham said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you're interested in experiencing biblical peace, you got to get things right with others. And here's one, another way to do it. Value relationships over stuff. Yeah, that's good. When you are in a tense situation and you have to make a choice, choose the relationship over the stuff. And you'll see as you read the rest of the story, Abraham chose the better land, or at least what looked like the better land, and there was peace between him and Abraham. But at the end of the day, God was writing a beautiful story for Abraham, and he utterly prospered in the direction he went. Ah, oh, it's so good. When we, um, number three, when we don't handle our relationship problems on a timely basis, things get worse. I speak the truth. 
Page 376 of your Believe book, Matthew chapter 5, again, the teachings of Jesus and the famous Sermon on the Mount. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This particular principle, just being honest, is one of my greatest weaknesses and has gotten me into trouble. Uh, I have been in one and or actually many situations, several situations where I knew there was a problem, but I didn't address it on a timely basis. And that problem ended up blowing up and getting a lot worse later. I don't know what I was thinking. Like maybe if I just delay, it will go away, but it never did. Right now, there is likely something, someone in your life where there is the beginning of trouble or trouble exists, and the encouragement is to deal with it now before it becomes a colossal mess later. I remember several years ago, I was moving from Chicago to San Antonio, and one of my, uh, one of my uh, crowns came off of a back molar, and nothing hurt, and I was really busy in the move, so I just didn't do anything about it. Got to San Antonio, and after everything was settled, I kind of put my tongue back there, and it doesn't really hurt. I'm really busy, and I didn't deal with it. I let it go on and on and on, and then it finally started to hurt. And I went to the dentist, and he took a look at it, and he said, if you had come here when it first came off, we would have been able to save it, but now it's beyond saving I got the Novocaine and they pulled that puppy right out of the back of my jaw because I delayed. The same thing is true with our relationships as it is with our back molars. Amen. The next one comes from the teaching of Jesus as well. Matthew chapter six, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. <laughs> I have studied this passage all week looking for a way out of the severity of this teaching. And it doesn't exist. We have to let the teachings of Jesus lie on the page the way in which he said it. Now God certainly forgives us while we were still sinners. That's taught in the book of Romans and throughout the scriptures. This is your salvation. But there is something definitely wrong with the believer who has experienced the forgiveness of God through Christ who won't forgive another person in light of what God has done for them. At the very least, this is the best I could do for you. At the very least, the lack of forgiving another puts a serious barrier between you and your relationship with God. Because not forgiving somebody, listen to this, not forgiving somebody in the Bible for a believer is considered a sin. An unconfessed sin, as we've already stated, creates a barrier between you and God. So principle number three, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. My strong encouragement to you, and really to myself as well, is don't hold out to punish the other person because you are only birthing the seed of bitterness in your own soul. Don't do it. I've seen this as a pastor over all of these years, particularly amongst people who have been offended by a mate. I mean, I know that's a serious offense, but they go on with great tenacity to live their life in an unforgiving spirit, uh, and as a result, they become a pitiful and bitter person. I, I mean, I personally have two guys right now in my life who seriously need to come to me and ask for forgiveness. I mean, they seriously do. Uh, it's been a couple of years, and they've not done it yet, but before the Lord, I have decided to process it with a few other people Forgive them so that I can move on and live a productive life. When they come to me, forgiveness will be granted because in my heart, I have already forgiven them. Until then, it's on them. I'm not stuck. You get it? Okay, now listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 18. 
If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's a good one. Here's the next principle. Make peace a priority, but it won't work with everyone. Not your fault. Don't own it. There are some people who are determined to be miserable human beings. Do your very best to live at peace with them, but at the end of the day, let them be miserable on their own. Do your very best to live at peace with them. Do your very best and then let it go. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, last category, things are right with me. This is where I wanna camp for just a few minutes. Things are right with me. Then there are people who are just simply unsettled internally on the inside with themselves. Things are not right. For some of you, this is merely an episodic thing. For others of you, it is chronic. Well, for about 40 million of us, it is actually chronic. For some of you, you are not experiencing the feeling of peace and you might assume that it is a spiritual problem since you're a believer. Some of you right now are not experiencing the feeling of peace and you're assuming that you just don't have enough faith in God. But remember I said your spiritual, mental, emotional, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, mental and physical lives are all tied together. Um, I'm gonna give you four recommendations and then we're gonna end on our key verse. But these first four recommendations come from the scriptures but may exp- uh, express why you're not experiencing the feeling of peace and it has nothing to do with the fact that you didn't do your Bible study yesterday, okay? This is gonna be, I think, really helpful for you, okay? I'm gonna kind of run through these quite quickly, okay? Number one, have a team around you. I have found our tendencies when we're beginning to be unsettled in the inside is to go it alone. Do not do that. Whenever you're, well, at no season in your life should you go it alone, but when you're experiencing anxiety or fears or phobias and you're not sure that you should talk to anybody, people are gonna think you're crazy, that's when you should be running to community all along. And by the way, you shouldn't wait till you get into a place of crisis before you start to recognize that you need a small band of people around you I'm telling you, as a pastor, this is so important uh, for you. Um, uh, I I, I would suggest that for many of us, that not only involves a small group and family members, but oftentimes in seasons of our life when we're really experiencing trouble, it involves a counselor uh, for sure. Uh, The last episode of sort of um, a long uh, uh, experience depression and anxiety that I went through, uh, it included uh, Roseanne, Uh, and it included um, about five uh, individuals that I trusted. Uh, It included a Christian doctor, a Christian counselor, a Christian psychologist, a Christian psychiatrist. I mean, I put the A team together for me. So I'm just telling you, the reality is 63% of people who suffer from anxiety and fear never seek any treatment, even though it is possible to overcome You try to go it alone, and it creates a great hole for you. Your lead teaching pastor just admitted he needed help and had a big team of professionals around him. I'm not embarrassed about it. You shouldn't be either. Amen? Amen. Next one, get sleep. Sleep is foundational. Sleep is foundational. New studies are out that says when you uh, experience good REM sleep, that your body is actually flushing out toxins in your brain that actually cause anxieties and fears within you. And so if you're not getting a good night's sleep, and many of you are not, one in uh, two Americans, adult Americans, suffer from some form of insomnia. One in six suffer from chronic insomnia. And so a good night's sleep is foundational. If you do not get sleep, it's going to continue to raise uh, your anxiety and fear. If you're experiencing some serious anxiety, go to your doctor, as I have done, and for a short season of time, you'll get appropriate medicines uh, that he or she will monitor so that you can get your sleep and one day be free uh, from those medicines. Amen? Number three, exercise. Exercise is not just about losing weight and fitting into your summer swimsuit. Uh, 
Uh, exercise does so many more things for you, and Americans are not predominantly agrarian farmers anymore. We are sedentary, and it's killing us. When you exercise, it releases endorphins and hormones that promote peace. So make sure you have an exercise regimen. And number four, eat right. Eat right. You don't just eat to get into your summer swimsuit. When you eat the right kinds of foods, research now tells us there are foods that you can eat that promote the feeling of peace in your life. And you can do some research on that. I just found a few of them, okay? Uh, Asparagus, avocados, blueberries, turkey, almonds, yogurt, spinach, and salmon. I like very few of those things. (laughs) So I found like this shake. You just blend it all up and stick a banana in it and it tastes pretty good, okay? Some of you are saying, I'm doing my Bible study every day, but I still feel anxious. Uh, You may have to lay off of a bit of comfort food. Uh, Craig Oliver, who just spoke to us last week at the Margin Summit, uh, we are digging our graves with our teeth. My doctor told me over and over again, your health exists within your gut. So eat right, okay? Those are just four practical things that may have nothing to do with the fact that you're not doing your Bible study. But there are two really important principles that come from our key verse today, Philippians chapter four, that you have got to, I mean, this is like my favorite verse. I'm gonna read it to you, okay? Ephesians, I mean, Philippians chapter four. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Look at this. And the God of peace will be with you. Two principles. Number one, pray. And in this passage, prayer has three components. Listening, petition, and thanksgiving. And number two, bombard your mind with good things. When I was going through my episode a while back, this was the pattern that I, I engaged in through good counsel. One, I sought to get a good night's sleep. For about three months, it involved medication. I would get up, I would have a cup of decaf coffee because caffeine, my doctor tells me, wires most of us up. <laughs> and then I would go on a 5K run and some stretches. Then I would come back and take all those foods I don't like to eat and I'd blend them in a shake and I would sit down with God. It's nothing fancy. I I read a psalm and I prayed and I I took off of my office today. This is an entire journal of me journaling out my prayers and journaling out my thoughts. And most of this has to do with thinking about what is true When you are lacking peace in your life, oftentimes you are believing a lie. And you just have to keep writing over and over again, that's not true, this is. It didn't happen overnight. For me, it was a total of eight months. But I am once again at peace. And I'm experiencing the feeling of peace. You see the difference? So I'm gonna ask you the same question that Elisha asked the Shunammite woman. Are you all right? Are you at peace? Are you experiencing God's shalom? It may not be as easy as cutting the legs off of your bed, but God offers us hope found in our key idea. I am free from anxiety because things are right with God. Things are right with others and things are right with myself. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. 
I want you to be standing to your feet. A couple of things before we leave today. Number one, our prayer partners will be here at the front uh, of, the, of the auditorium. They would love to pray for you if you'd like to accept Christ today. Oh, that would be cool. Uh, at number two, if you have fears and anxieties or whatever the burden is, uh, please let these people pray for you. Uh, secondly, uh, we've got a, a Friday, Good Friday services coming up, and it's a wonderful prayer experience, great for your entire family. Uh, check that out in your program. I think we have some, uh, you know, the, the experiences uh, all day on Friday, Good Friday. And then we have our Easter services coming up, uh, seven of them uh, total here uh, at, uh, at Lenexa and Speedway. And what we're encouraging people to do is attend one, serve one. We desperately need the family of Westside to come alongside and help us with all the visitors we're taking in. So we're inviting you to come to one of the services and serve one. You can find uh, uh, the website to go uh, serve. You can talk to people out in the Connection Center or you can text serve uh, to this number. It's not gonna be up long enough for you to know that number, uh, but uh, we wanna invite you to uh, serve. Got that? Got that number? Okay. The, the next thing we want to tell you about is baptisms. We are going to be uh, experiencing baptisms throughout all of our Easter services. And if you have never publicly professed Christ as your Savior, I cannot think of a better, better day to do it on. I talked to a little girl yesterday in the rec center. She's about 10 years old. And she says, Pastor Randy, I'm being baptized on Easter. And she was just like telling everybody about it. That is the spirit that puts a smile on the face of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now as you go, may light with no darkness fall along your path. May love without fear and bitterness be in your heart. May truth without falsehood be in your mind. May the peace of God be at the center of your life. And may the presence that can never be taken away from you go with you.